one of the things that underlies a lot of your work is that the robots you create, the systems you have created for for over 40 years now, have a kind of, they're not cautious. So a lot of robots that people know about move about this world very cautiously, carefully, very afraid of the world. Uh, a lot of the robots you built, especially in the early days, were very aggressive, uh, underactuated. They're hopping. They're <laughs> they're wild, moving quickly. So what is there a philosophy underlying that? Well, let me tell you about how I got started on legs at all. I, when I was still a graduate student, I went to a conference. It was a biological legged locomotion conference, and I think it was in Philadelphia. So it was all biomechanics people, you know, researchers who would look at muscle and maybe neurons and things like that. They weren't so much computational people, but they were more biomechanics. And maybe there were a thousand people there. And I went to a talk, uh, one of the talks, all the talks were about the body of either animals or people and respiration, things like that. But one talk was by a robotics guy mm -hmm. and he showed a six legged uh, robot that walked very slowly. Um, it always had at least three feet on the ground. So it worked like a table or a chair with tripod stability and it moved really slowly. And I just looked at that and said, wow, that's wrong. You know, that's not, that's not anything like how people and animals work because we bounce and fly. You know, we have to predict what's going to happen in order to keep our balance when we're taking a running step or something like that. We use the springiness in our, in our legs, you know, our muscles and our tendons and things like that as part of the story, you know, the energy circulates. We don't just throw it away mm -hmm. every time. So and I'm not sure I understood all that when I first thought, but I, I definitely got inspired to say, you know, let's try the opposite. And I didn't have a clue as to how to make a hopping robot work, not real, you know, not balanced in 3D. Uh, in fact, when I started, it was all just about the energy of bouncing. And I was going to have a springy thing in the leg and some actuator so that you could get an energy uh, regime going of bouncing. And the idea that balance was an important part of it didn't come until a little later. Uh, and then, you know, I made the, the one like it, uh, the pogo stick robots. Mm -hmm. Now I think that we need to do that in manipulation. If you look at robot manipulation, we've been working, we, a community has been working on it for 50 years. We're nowhere near human levels of manipulation. I mean, we can, you know, it's come along, but I think it's all too safe. And uh, I think trying to break out of that safety thing of static grasping you know if you look at the a lot of work that goes on it's about the geometry of the part and then and then you figure out how to move your hand so that you can position it with respect to that and then you grasp it carefully and then you move it well that's not anything like how people and animals work you know we juggle in our hands we hold multiple objects and can sort them um so now to be fair uh, being more aggressive is going to mean things aren't going to work very well for a while. So it's a long, it's a longer term approach to the problem. Um, but that, and that's just theory now, you know, maybe that won't pay off, but that's sort of how I'm trying to think about it, trying to, uh, encourage our group to, to go at it. Well, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about what it means <laughs> to, what, what is the actual thing we're trying to optimize in, uh, for a robot, you know, sometimes, especially with human robot interaction, maybe, flaws is a good thing. Uh, perfection is not necessarily the right thing to be chasing. Just like you said, maybe maybe being good at fumbling an object, uh, being good at fumbling might be the right thing to optimize versus per perfect modeling of the object and perfect movement of the arm to grasp, grasp that object. Because uh, maybe perfection is not supposed to exist in the real world. I don't know if you know my friend Matt Mason, who's a uh who is the uh, director of the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon, and we go back to graduate school together. But he analyzed um, a movie of Julia Childs doing a cooking thing. And she did, I think he said something like, there were 40 different ways that she handled a thing, and none of them was grasping. He would, she would nudge, roll, flatten with her you know, knife, things like that, and none of them was grasping. <laughs> so, okay, let's go back to the early days. First of all, sure. you've, you've uh, created and led the the leg lab, the legendary leg lab at MIT. So what, what was that first hopping robot? Can you? But first of all, the leg lab actually started at Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon. So I was a professor there starting uh, in 1980. 
uh, in to about 1986. And uh, so that's where the first hopping machines were built, uh, starting, I guess we got the first one working in about 1982, something like that. That was a simplified one. Then we got a three-dimensional one in 1983. The quadruped that uh, we built at the Leg Lab, the first version, was built in about 1984-5 and really only got going about 86 or so and it took years of development to get it to really let's just do. pause here <laughs> for people who don't know i'm talking to mark raber founder of boston dynamics but before that you were a professor developing some of the most incredible robots for 15 years and before that of course a grad student and all that so you've been doing this for a really long time so we, you like skipped over this but like go go to the first hopping robot there's videos of some of this i mean these are incredible robots so you talked about the first the very first step was to get a thing hopping up and down. Right. And then you realized, well, balancing is the thing you should care about and it's actually a solvable problem. So you, can you just go through how to create that robot? What was what sure. What was involved in creating that robot? Well, I'm gonna start on the not the technical side, mm -hmm. but the uh I guess we could call it the motivational side or sure. the funding side. <laughs> so before Carnegie Mellon, I was actually at JPL, at the Jet Propulsion Lab for three years. And while I was there, I connected up with uh, Ivan Sutherland, who is sometimes regarded as the father of computer graphics because of work he did both at MIT and then University of Utah and Evans and Sutherland. Anyway, um, I got to know him. And at one point he said, uh, he encouraged me to uh, do some kind of project uh, at Caltech, even though I was at JPL, you know, those are kind of related institutions. And uh, so I, I thought about it uh, and I made up a list of three possible projects. Mm -hmm. And I purposely made the top one and the bottom one really boring sounding. And in the middle, I put a pogo stick robot. And when he looked at it, you know, Ivan is a, a brilliant, uh, you know, brilliant guy, brilliant engineer, and uh, real cultivator of people. He looked at it and knew right away what the thing that was worth doing. And so he, you know, he had an endowed chair. So he had about $3,000 that he gave me to build the first model, which I went, you know, I went to the shop and with my own hands kind of made a first model, which, which didn't work uh, and was just, you know, a, a beginning uh, shot at it. And uh, Ivan and I took that to Washington. And in those days, you could just walk into DARPA and walk down the hallway and see who's there. Yeah. And Ivan, who had been there in his previous life. And so we walked around and uh, we looked in the offices. Of course, I didn't know anything. You know, I was basically a kid, but Ivan knew his way around. And we found Craig Fields uh, in his office. Craig later became the director of DARPA, but in those days, he was a program manager. And so we went in, I had a little Samsonite suitcase, which we opened and it had just the skeleton of this uh, one-legged hopping robot and we showed it to him. And uh, you could almost see the drool going down his chin. So it was of excitement. And he sent me $250,000. He said, okay, uh, I'll, uh, I wanna fund this. Uh, and I was between institutions. I was just about to leave JPL and I hadn't decided yet where I was going next. And then when I landed at CMU, he sent two hundred fifty thousand dollars, which in nineteen eighty was a lot of a lot of research money. Did you see the possibility of where this is going? Why this is an important problem? <laughs> no, <laughs> the balancing. I mean, it's legged. It, it has to do with legged locomotion. I mean, it has to do with all these problems that 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 are that the human body solves when we're walking, for example. Like all the fundamentals are there. Yeah, I mean, I think that was the motivation to try and get more at the fundamentals of how animals work. But the idea that it would result in, you know, machines that were anything like practical, uh, like we're making now, that, that wasn't anywhere in my head, no. You know, as an academic, I was mostly just trying to do the next thing, you know, uh, make some progress, impress my colleagues if I could. And have fun. And have fun. Pogo yeah. stick robot. Pogo stick robot. So what was on the technical side, what are the, some of the challenges of getting up, getting to the point where we saw like in the video the the pogo stick robot that's actually successfully hopping and then eventually doing flips and all this kind of stuff. Well, in the very early days, I needed some better engineering than I had than I could do myself, and I hired uh, Ben Brown. You know, we we each had our way of contributing to the design, and we came up with a thing that could 
could start to work. I had some stupid ideas about how the actuation system should work, and uh, we you know we sorted that out. It wasn't that hard to make it balanced once you get the the physical machine to be working well enough uh, and have enough control over the degrees of freedom. Uh, and then we very quickly, you know, we started out by having it floating on an inclined air table, and then uh, that only gave us like six foot of travel. So once it started working, we switched to a thing that could run around the room on a another device. It's hard to explain these without you seeing them, but you, you probably know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. a planarizer. And, uh, and then the next big step was to make it work in 3D, which that was really the scary part. With these simple things, you know, people had inverted pendulums at the time for, for years and they could control them by driving a cart back and forth. But could you make it work in three dimensions while it's bouncing and all that? And, uh, but it turned out, you know, not to be that hard to do. Uh, at least at the level of performance we achieved at the time. So, okay, you mentioned inverted pendulum, but like, uh, can you explain how a hopping stick in 3D can control, can balance itself? Yeah, sure. what, are, what What does the actuation look like? Uh, you know, the simple story is that there's three things going on. There's something making it bounce. And, you know, we, we had a system that was... Uh, estimating how high the robot was off the ground and using that you know uh there's energy that can be in three places in a in a pogo stick one is in the spring one is in the altitude and the other is in the velocity mm -hmm. and so when at the top of the hop it's all in the the height and so you could just measure how high you're going and thereby thereby have an idea of a lot about the cycle and you could decide whether to put more energy in or less so that's one element then there's a part that you decide where to put the foot. And if you think when you're landing on the ground with respect to the center of mass, so if you think of a pole vaulter, the key thing the pole vaulter has to do is get its body to the right place when the pole gets stuck. If they're too far forward, uh, they kind of get thrown backwards. If they're too far back, they go you know, over. And what they need to do is get it so that they go mostly up to get over the thing. And you know, high jumpers is the same kind of thing. So there's a calculation about where to put the foot, and we did something you know, relatively simple. And then there's a third part to keep the body at an attitude that's upright, because if it gets too far, you, know, you could hop and just keep <laughs> rotating around, but if it gets too far, then you run out of motion of the joints at the hips, so you have to do that. And we did that by applying a torque between the legs and the body every time the foot's on the ground. You only can do it while the foot's on the ground. Mm -hmm. In the air, you know, it, 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 the physics don't work out. How far does it have to tilt before it's too late to be able to balance itself? Or it's impossible to balance itself, correct itself? Well, you're, you're asking an interesting question because um, in those days, we didn't actually optimize things. And they probably could have gone much further than we did and then had higher performance. And we just kind of got you know a sketch of a solution and worked on that. And then in years since, some people working for us, some people working for others, people came up with all kinds of uh, equations for or you know algorithms for how to do a better job, be able to go faster. Uh, one of my students worked on getting things to go faster. Another one worked on uh, climbing over obstacles because when you're running, it's one on the open ground. It's one thing if you're running like up a stair. Uh, you have to adjust where you are, otherwise things don't work out right. You land your foot on the edge of the step. So there's other degrees of freedom to control if you're getting to you know more realistic, practical situations. I think it's really interesting to ask about the early days because you know believing in yourself, believing that there's something interesting here, and then you mentioned find, finding somebody else, Ben Brown. What's that like? Finding other people with whom you can build this crazy idea and actually make it work. Probably the smartest thing I ever did <laughs> is to find the other people. Yeah. I mean, when I look at it now, you know, I look at Boston Dynamics and all the really excellent engineering there. You know, people who really make stuff work. You know, I'm I'm only the the dreamer. So when you talk about pogo stick robot or legged robots, whether it's quadrupeds or humanoid robots, did people doubt that this is possible? Did you experience a lot of people around you kind of? I don't. I don't know if they doubted whether it was possible, but I think they thought it was a waste of time. <laughs> oh, it's not even an interesting problem. Were... I think for a lot of people, you know, people who were. I think it's been it's been both though. Some people 
I think I felt like they were saying, oh, you know, why are you wasting your time on this stupid problem? And then, but then I've been at many things where uh, people have told me it's been an inspiration to, uh, to go out and, uh, you know, attack these, uh, these harder things. And, and I think it has turned out, I think legged locomotion has turned out to be a useful thing. 